Dr. Jerome Katz. He's the Coleman Found Foundation Professor of Entrepreneurship at the Joan Cook School of Business at St. Louis University. He's going to talk to us about the development and methods of entrepreneurship education. Please help me welcome Thank Dr. You. Jerome. Good morning. I want to thank you all for being here. I, I know uh, people have been working and uh, entertaining late last night. I'm from St. Louis University in St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, our city uh, has a baseball team who is, uh, are currently in the World Series. Their game started at four this morning. So uh, uh, there are, I have colleagues here who still are probably snoring from uh, uh, staying up even later than our hosts have uh, done. My goal here today is to talk to you a little bit about entrepreneurship education. I was asked to come here and explain why entrepreneurship education is in fact one of the hottest things going on. I've been teaching entrepreneurship for 32 years, first at Wharton School and for the past 25 years at St. Louis University. Our program is one of the first 25 in the nation. It, uh, our center was one of the first 25 in the world. Uh, our program has been ranked in the top 25 every year since 1994. So we have developed a technique, and I will tell you that where many uh, people are telling you how they had to fight to get entrepreneurship into the curriculum, uh, entrepreneurship in our program, in our university, is recognized as one of the premier academic programs. And I want to share with you how that goes about and also share with you the broader perspective of the movement of entrepreneurship that you are a part of today. So first, I want to thank all of yesterday's presenters because there were about 26 slides that I would have had to go through very quickly about uh, why entrepreneurship is good, why it helps, uh, why job creation is good. You all did a much better job than I did yesterday, and I deeply thank you which also saves a little bit of time for some of the other topics. Entrepreneurship education is not new. It has been around for quite a long time. The belief was, prior to World War II, that you cannot teach entrepreneurship. There was someone yesterday who had said, oh, there's a debate. Can you teach entrepreneurship? There's no debate. The debate was settled 30 years ago. We have been teaching entrepreneurship. We, can, we know we can teach entrepreneurship. I'm going to talk to you about how we can even show you how entrepreneurship education makes a difference. Between World War II and 1990 and the early days of entrepreneurship education, the focus was very much on finding the right way to teach it. By 1990, we knew the best and worst ways to teach entrepreneurship. And since then, we've been basically focusing on promoting the best practices. But just teaching the right way was not enough. People demanded more of us. Our, uh, uh, our own provosts, rectors, were demanding more of us. The communities were demanding more of us. And so we started putting in a great deal of attention to measure the impacts of entrepreneurship education. And we've been making tremendous strides in that. That's where we are today. Now, there is a, a point that entrepreneurship is just small business. Uh, uh, that's a bit of a myth. Entrepreneurship refers to all kinds of businesses. There was some discussion yesterday about SMEs versus high growth businesses. Let me stop and uh, point out something. Every business is important. Why? The more businesses you have, the more entrepreneurship you have. If people see a successful restaurateur, they see a, a, a successful app maker for smartphones, they become more enthusiastic. The more people they see doing entrepreneurship, the more they feel they can do it. In fact, I will tell you what's critical. To see a stupid person become a successful entrepreneur. You, know, you go into a restaurant, you're having good food, you're being taken care of well. The owner comes over and talks to you. And the owner, you know, five minutes of talk, you say how much you like the food, the decor, the service. And when the owner leaves, you think, he is running this? I can do better. That's fine. If you can do better, that's the start of a business right there. So uh, small business, there is no such thing as small business. All of these multimillionaire entrepreneurs, OK? So yes, they work 16 hours a day. That's part of the business. But when they leave business, what do they want? Do they want to go someplace where it's boring? No, they want to live in a place. So when they walk away, 
from their computer. There are interesting restaurants, there are interesting shops, there are interesting things to do. Richard Florida talks about the creative class because the creative class is essential to the entrepreneurial class. And the creative class are your artists, your artisans. They're the people who create the kinds of businesses, restaurants, shops, and the like that make a place exciting to be in for the entrepreneurs. So this is entrepreneurs helping other entrepreneurs enjoy life, and this is how you build a community of entrepreneurs. People say you can't, there's, every once in a while you do hear someone who says, you can't teach entrepreneurship. Well, no, you can, and I'll show you, uh, I'll show you the proof of that. And then I, had, well, I was told uh, when I was interviewing at uh, my university, my current university, 26 years ago, someone said entrepreneurship was intellectually worthless, and I will show you how to prove them wrong. All right, so let's go at this. That, first off, all businesses start as small businesses. When we talk about entrepreneurship only as small business, we're kind of missing the uh, point. Uh, Google started with two employees. That's a small business. They didn't know at the time that they were going to become one of the world's most valuable companies. So don't, don't try and guess what's going to be the success. All businesses are important. Some firms are high growth. Now, we can actually help. I can tell you this from experience. We can help students find a path to become a high growth business where they might not even have been thinking of it. And the fact is, you've got, we know what it takes to be part of that high growth approach. For example, uh, you need to have students planning for the business. I'm not saying you have to have a business plan. Now, I run an angel network. We won't look at an idea unless there's a business plan because that's literally what we know we're investing in. But the fact is, if a student thinks about what they're doing before they do it, they will do a better job of it. We know that we need to get students to focus on competitive advantage because the fact is, if you have a good idea, you will face competition. Do you have a way to stave them off? We need to make them focus on metrics. But you know this. A student who's not being judged on anything or graded on anything doesn't do anything. They need to know what they're going to be graded on. And the businesses are no different than what we see for them in our classes. We talk about the most successful high growth businesses have some degree of other people's money or OPM. So getting students ready to pursue that money, getting them used to the networking that selling kind of approach is essential to making them a high growth business. Most important, you have to talk to your customers because the fact is talking is what entrepreneurship is all about. Talking about your dream to your customers, your team, to potential suppliers and partners. And you always have to be pushing up. You have to be looking for something more, aiming for a better tomorrow for you, your people, your technology, the world. Always test, evaluate, revise. In a room with a lot of uh, engineers, I know uh, I am preaching to the converted, so just please share that point of view with the business people and the people from other disciplines because they need to see that too. All right. This is a complex picture, and I apologize for it. If anyone here has a better way to show it, come talk to me after the session. I will give you all honors for it. This is the population of entrepreneurs. And you can pick whatever country you want to. I did this based largely on the US numbers because I know the most about it. The red represent all the people uh, who are starting businesses outside of the university. The green represent people who have, are starting businesses. They're either inside the university or they are getting help. The US Small Business Administration for a very long time said half of all businesses that start fail. Now, we're, uh, they figured out, they paid for research, some great research done by friends of Bob Strom and I, who uh, proved that, no, actually, most businesses don't fail after two years. Most businesses are still going six years out. And I'll tell you a secret. It's easy to know which businesses are more likely to survive. The single biggest factor in their survival is getting help. If 60% of businesses are running uh, six years after starting, because uh, just in general, when you start talking about people who were in your classes, taking entrepreneurship classes, people who went to centers, entrepreneurship centers, like the one Mike was talking about, people who have gone for help to the government agencies, did you know that their success rate jumps into the 80 and 90% range? Help helps. That's the simplest thing. The help you offer 
the help that can be offered by experts outside make a difference in what goes on. That's why, if you notice, there's an area of failure. There are a lot of people who fail when they start their business, and most of them didn't get help. But if the people get help, very few of them fail. As you move up into survival and then into success above that, you discover that those people who had gotten help are more successful. And they actually represent a higher percentage of the successful companies. At the very, very top, the big scores, your, your Googles, the very famous startups, Tesla and the like. Look at the bar there. Can you imagine creating a billion dollar company without involving lawyers, accountants, and experts of all sorts? It's impossible. So by the time you start talking about the high growth businesses, you're talking about people who are routinely getting help to make them be more successful. So what happens? If you provide education, there are fewer failures. You have more successes because of education and help. You have, in effect, more big scores. The chance of getting a billion dollar business becomes much greater once you've got people getting help and getting pushed along the way. Let me tell you the story about what was going on. The fellow's name is Fletcher Calder. Uh, Fletcher was in our business plan class. He and his best friend had been working for a man who uh, had a tile company. So uh, they install tubs, they uh, repair tile in bathrooms. The two guys had been working there. The company was making thirty to forty thousand dollars profit a year. The two young men uh, knew that the owner was getting old and wanted to get out of the business. They actually uh, Fletcher did a business plan in our class to buy out the business and figure out how to grow it. So I was able to connect him with a uh, mentor, co-teacher of my class. By the way, every class at SLU, at, I say SLU, St. Louis University, SLU. Every class in the entrepreneurship program is co-taught by a standing professor like myself and an, a practicing entrepreneur, Tim Hayden, who has uh, been, has uh, talked, raise your hand, Tim, so they, okay, that guy. Uh, he's actually one of my students, but he also co-taught with me, uh, and he's my most senior adjunct professor uh, these days. Trey Gady, who works for Saudi Aramco, for the Wyed uh, group at Saudi Aramco, is also another one of our teachers. Fletcher did a business plan to uh, buy this business and grow it. Uh, one of his mentors connected him to a bank that gave him a loan, and the mentor and his partner invested equity in the business. They put in about $30,000. The bank offered them a, a loan, a line of credit of $100,000. His business grew from that $30,000 profit the year they bought it to over a million dollars of profit three years later. That's still a small business. But that's a million dollars of profit. By the second, by the a year after that, he and his partner were both millionaires and continue to be one, to this day. That's the difference that we can make when we do this. So, what can we do? We can actually, through the educational programs we've got, decrease mistakes, increase the uh, speed of success, getting people to the top faster, and we can improve the practice and regular people. All right, not everyone's going to become an entrepreneur. Uh, but the fact is that even for people who are going to do this, selling on eBay, uh, a little bit of consulting on the side or something like that, we can help all of these people to, to avoid the mistakes. That's a lot of what we do. They avoid the mistakes. We also help them to uh, improve themselves whenever possible. They are better at looking at opportunities. How, to, how powerful is the ability to look for opportunities? Okay. When was the last time you saw a red Maserati. Okay? Think about that for a second. Okay? I guarantee you, today, when you leave and you start going home, you're driving, you're doing your chores, you're uh, having dinner, you will see a red Maserati today. Why? Because I've just prepared you for opportunity. I've made you aware of opportunity. And you, knowing I should be looking for a red Maserati, you will see one today. It's been out there all the time. The opportunities have been out there all the time. But we can actually get people to be aware of opportunities in ways they never were before. The other thing is, for those students who are never going to become entrepreneurs, having seen what entrepreneurship is really like, having seen the hard work, seen what dedication does, knowing the statistics about entrepreneurship will make them 
better employees, and better supporters of entrepreneurship in our economies and our societies. So you're literally preparing the, the, your country to appreciate entrepreneurship more by teaching it, even if those students don't become entrepreneurs. All right. Entrepreneurship is intellectually worthless. No, not true at all. First off, the fact is that among the hottest topics, I'm, my training is in psychology. I teach in the Department of Management. Uh, if you look at the research that's out today, what are the hottest topics? There are things like emergence processes, how a, a person becomes a firm, literally the creation going up, up a level of analysis from an individual to a firm. The creation of high velocity environments, which describe most uh, startups where decisions have to be made one after the other after another, unceasingly. And coping with resource scarcity. The fact is entrepreneurs have to be able to do things on a very small budget. And we want them to be on a very small budget. Giving them too much money makes them sloppy in their thinking and operations. Take any management journal right now. I took the latest issue of Academy of Management Journal. Very, very highly rated journal, very high impact factor. Their last issue, two of 12 articles were on entrepreneurship. The sponsoring organization, the Academy of Management, has 25 division, of which entrepreneurship is only one. So we should have 4% of the journal. But no, in fact, we had uh, two out of 12, one six, 16%, almost 17% of the journal. We're, uh, we draw well. AMR, Academy of Management Review, even higher rating. One of six articles. In their dialogue section, three of the four articles involved entrepreneurship. SMJ, the Strategic Management Journal, uh, uh, three of six articles either talked about entrepreneurship or needed to use samples of entrepreneurs to prove their point. Entrepreneurship is central to modern marketing and management theory. There are more than 150 English language referee journals out there. I keep a list. There's the URL, which of course will be posted with the uh, 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 slides after our uh, presentations, and you can pull it up there. All right. The five things that are central to contemporary business education. First, business plans. Uh, I will tell you that in America there is a bit of a controversy. In the, on the East and West Coast, they say, oh, you don't need a plan. Uh, and the fact is they have so many ideas floating around that uh, angel groups and venture capitalists don't want to see plans initially. They want to see pi uh, a pitch deck, a PowerPoint slide presentation to figure out if an idea is worth looking at a business plan. But if they do like that, you have to have a business plan ready. In the Midwest where I live, we want to see a plan from the start. So elevator pitches, uh, basically an elevator pitch in, uh, where are we on? Okay. Elevator pitch is uh, you put a student in an elevator with uh, the way we do it, we took the, hot, the tallest building in our city and in fact in our state. It's 40 stories tall. It's a 40 second elevator ride to the top. We put a student on with two entrepreneurs. Uh, the, I think the combined, we had uh, 12 elevators running, 24 entrepreneurs, and the total wealth of the entrepreneurs was quarter of a bill? Almost a billion. Almost a billion dollars. All right, student has 40 seconds to pitch their business. The door's closed, 40 seconds to pitch your business. At the end of that, if the entrepreneur likes you, they give you their business card, and the student with the most business cards wins. Uh, it's a wonderful technique. We can run, uh, run everyone through it in just a matter of uh, really about an hour. Uh, we went through uh, 25 students, and everyone has a great time and learns an enormous amount. There are simulations. One of the things that's kind of interesting is to help students understand the ebb and flow of business, the dynamics of business. We actually have excellent simulations. So we'll let them create a business and run a business for 6, 12, 24 months, seeing what, they, what the selling process is like, the relationship between sales and inventory, the relationship between sales and cash flow, things like that. For students, particularly undergrads, who don't have business experience, Running, uh, uh, having them run on a simulation uh, for a year, a simulated year, really gives them much more insight about how business operates than anything else. We have 120 undergraduate majors. We have about uh, 20 MBA majors. We have four post-MBA certificate, uh, pers uh, people pursuing a certificate. We had over 350 entrepreneurs come through our organization last year through our department. They served as mentors, as speakers, as judges. So basically every student was exposed 
to uh, uh, dozens and actually had uh, uh, contact with three times as many entrepreneurs as there were students in our own program. And this was, uh, took tremendous work on our part, but it also, as uh, Mike was talking about with uh, Vanderbilt, uh, ties your students to the community, ties your community to your program. One other thing, there are books. Uh, actually, one of, this is uh, my textbook, Entrepreneurial Small Business. Uh, it's used in 260 schools in the U.S., about 10% of uh, the, uh, uh, the schools teaching entrepreneurship in the U.S. It's the second largest selling book in the world. The entire nation of Korea adopted this book for their uh, entrepreneurship programs at 61 universities uh, this past year. We're translating it there. So there is help. There are resources available to you to make this work. There's also, uh, you are part here, just participating today, thinking about teaching entrepreneurship in your classes, talking to the entrepreneurship people here at the university, makes you part of a giant global effort to promote and develop entrepreneurship worldwide. The Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, GEM, uh, started in 10 countries, is now in 69, and I believe will probably uh, hit more than 80 by, uh, for this year's uh, operation of it. Global Entrepreneurship Week has more than 130 countries involved. In the EU, they passed the Oslo Agenda. Every student in every college in the EU will be given some amount of entrepreneurship education, regardless of their major. Because, for example, 50% of the authors in the United States are self-employed. 50% of artists, of musicians, of therapists are self-employed. I can go through the list of occupations and the number, the percentages of people who are self-employed are significant. And those people need exposure to entrepreneurship education to be successful. Today in the United States, there are more than 2,300 universities teaching entrepreneurship. There are 500 plus endowed positions in entrepreneurship alone. So entrepreneurship makes a difference in our economies. It is. A, or it is an entity, a discipline, who has a strong academic uh, foundation. It can be taught. Teaching it, in fact, makes a difference in the performance of our students and our economies. There are a host of technologies that can help you teach this well. The moral of this is you can do this, and you should. Questions? Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Dr. McCauley. I'm the legal advisor to the director. Okay, I'm just wondering why the entrepreneurship activity attracting males rather than females? Does that have anything to do with, with the genetic differences? Actually, uh, you know, in the U.S., our university uh, are combined men, men and women together. And in fact, uh, uh, the growth of entrepreneurship among women in the United States is faster than the growth of entrepreneurship among males. There are more women who are pursuing entrepreneurship. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. There are more men pursuing it than women, but the number of women keeps growing, and there are more, uh, a larger percent. Uh, worldwide, actually, uh, it, it is growing. The Global Entrepreneurship Monitor shows this. Uh, the biggest challenges really come from uh, cultural and legal restrictions in countries. But in fact, at that point, there's a discussion about the underground economy or the gray economy. And even in places where entrepreneurship is not permitted to women, women are still pursuing entrepreneurship as part of this underground economy. So, uh, you know, and the interesting thing about that is we don't, uh, the government officially doesn't track that. So the levels of entrepreneurship among women are actually much higher than reported, even in countries that have restrictions on this. Uh, Final question. Any age limitation for startups? Okay, absolutely not. How many people in here have had KFC chicken? Show of hands. Uh, chickens? Chickens? Okay, good. All right. Well, you wonderful. Do you know how old Harlan Sanders was when he started KFC? 65. 65. By the way, he had had two restaurants before uh, KFC. Both of them failed. And it took him to get KFC, to get the funding for KFC. This is a man with two failures on his record. He had to talk to over 1,000 bankers and rich people until he got someone to back him financially. There's never an age limit. 
We had, uh, uh, Tim was talking about it yesterday, we have a TREP start day. We had almost 1,000 high school students coming in to, uh, because of their interest in entrepreneurship. We had 15 rock star entrepreneurs. We had, a, he mentioned it yesterday, we had a 12-year-old girl who has a cooking show on cable TV. And uh, she has her salad dressings are in a uh, uh, national uh, grocery chain. She's a multimillionaire. She was actually doing this from the time she was 10. There is no age limit. Well, thank you all. Th thank you very much. Thank you.